large tracts of psychological and neurobiological research inform us that the mind contains two systems for making judgments and decisions. Psychologists Keith Stanovich and Richard West coined System 1 and System 2 as names for them in compliance with the tradition of scientific neutrality and dryness. System 1 is automatic, rapid, intuitive, and usually seems to operate involuntarily. System 2 is deliberative, slower, oriented toward computation and logic, and usually operates consciously and voluntarily. In fact, when we say we're thinking about something, we usually are referring to System 2. The dual systems framework raises three issues regarding ignorance. First, how does each system deal with unknowns? Second, how much can we know about how each of our systems operates? And third, to what extent do or can they operate together? Let's start with the first question, namely how systems one and two deal with unknowns. Here are some examples of unknowns that system one deals with effectively. What color is this blouse? How did that loud noise suddenly come from? Is my doctor talking down to me right now? How do I feel about that snake on the path in front of me? Where do I need to be to catch the ball that was just thrown in the air? Now, here are some examples of unknowns for which we rely on system two. On which day of the week will the next Christmas fall? How many tomato seedlings should I plant in my three by five meter garden plot? Am I behaving appropriately in this meeting? Are the arguments for legalizing cannabis usage for medical purposes valid? Which smartphone is the best value for money? System one uses both learned associations such as names of colors and innate associations such as fear of snakes. It also possesses learned skills such as catching a ball or assessing another person's feelings by their tone of voice. Because it is quick, we rely on system one in situations where there is too little information or too much information to deploy system two, catching a ball, reacting to a sudden appearance of a snake in front of you, and many of the decisions you routinely, routinely make during a conversation are instances where rapid decisions are required. The expert firefighter does not pay attention to every aspect of the fire. Instead, she selectively focuses on key cues about how the fire developed and what it is likely to do next. Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, is devoted to investigating System 1 and how it operates. There are two intriguing messages from the research on which Gladwell's book is based. First, our best rapid-fire intuitions and decisions owe their quality to ignoring most of the available information and focusing on just the essentials. Gladwell's term for this is thin slicing. Most of us can do this routinely in some settings, for example, when we detect sarcasm in someone's tone of voice. The second message in Blink is that thin slicing can be learned. After all, this is an important aspect of expertise in domains that require decision-making in dynamic or complex environments. System 2, on the other hand, uses rules, logic, search methods, computation, and mental simulation. System 2 processes are effortful and focus attention on the task at hand, whereas System 1 monitors everything that's going on. System 1 provides most of the source information for System 2 to work with in the form of memories, impressions, intuitions, associations, and recognitions. However, System 2 also enables us to reconsider and critique the judgments or decisions proposed by System 1. That said, System 2 is far from perfect. We don't always reason or compute correctly, and there are some tasks in which System 2 is famously fallible, such as dealing with probability. Now let's turn to the second question. How much can we know about Systems 1 and 2? System 2 is largely accessible to conscious inspection. It's what we think thinking is all about. In fact, as Danny Kahneman put it, System 2 is who we think we are. System 1, however, is involuntary, automatic, and largely, un largely unconscious. Nevertheless, if you're asked how we made a de uh, decision generated by System 1, we happily make up and believe a story about that. Richard Nisbet and Timothy Wilson conducted seminal experiments demonstrating that we actually are very poor at having access to most, our most important mental processes, but, but delude, delude ourselves into believing that we know our own minds. Because System 1 is inaccessible to conscious inspection, we often distrust it. A lot of folk wisdom tells us that taking longer to think about a decision, being aware of how we make inferences and how we weigh up evidence, and the steps we take to arrive at a conclusion all enhance the quality of our decisions. System 1 is mute, so it lacks the ability to come to its own defense. Of course, there are good reasons to check out what System 1 delivers. Here's a version of one famous demonstration of how System 1 can lead us astray. 
An entree and a main dish at a restaurant cost $40 together. The main dish costs three times as much as the entree. What's the price of the entree? Take a few moments to come up with your answer. Many of us will have picked up on the fact that 4 times 10 equals 40, so our intuitive answer is $10. If System 2 is on the alert, a bit of thought should tell you that this can't be right, because $10 plus 4 times 10 gives a total price of $50, not 40. A little method of arithmetic should then reveal that the correct answer has to be $8 for the entree. Sure enough, 4 times 8 is 32, and 8 plus 32 makes 40. In the restaurant price problem, if you decided the price of the entree was 10, it wasn't just a failure of System 1. It may also have been because you didn't bother kicking your System 2 into gear. Kahneman points out that even at elite American universities, about half of the students tested on problems like this one fail, even though they are clearly capable of performing the elementary reasoning and calculation required to get the right answers. He concludes that many of us are lazy when it comes to using System 2 and overconfident about relying on System 1 to get us by. Stanovich and West take this one step further by positing that System 2 has two distinct parts. The first is an, algorithm, an algorithmic component that deals with logical inference and computation. The second component they call rationality, which amounts to a capacity for being mentally alert, skeptical of intuitions, and intellectually engaged. This rational component amounts to what some psychologists and educators describe as critical thinking ability. Systems 1 and 2 collaborate much of the time, even when it would appear that there isn't enough time for System 2 to get going. Gary Klein is one of the founders of a research program on what has been called naturalistic decision making. He and his colleagues have studied expert decision makers engaging in rapid fire decision making, such as firefighters, jet fighter pilots, chess players, and team sports players. One of their chief findings is that the prevalent role of pattern recognition in this kind of decision making. Pattern recognition is a high level set of learned associations between a collection of complex situations, such as a building on fire, and a repertoire of response strategies, such as where to start attacking the blaze. A trained seasoned firefighter finds the closest similarities between the building burning scenario in front of her and those in her memory, and bases her strategy for fighting the fire on what worked and didn't work in similar cases. The recognition primed decisions rely on, on System 1 to come up with the pattern match and on System 2 to mentally simulate the candidate strategy to check whether it will work. The key difference between expert and novice intuition is that experts have developed far greater conscious access to their System 1 than novices have. An example of this from an account by Klein featured in Blink begins with a lieutenant firefighter leading his team and dealing with a fire in the kitchen of a one-story house. Uncharacteristically, the fire did not abate despite being rep repeatedly doused. The lieutenant felt something was wrong and said to his men, let's get out now. Just after they did, the floor on which they had been standing collapsed. The real fire was in the basement. When Klein interviewed this man about where that intuition came from, he mentioned just three anomalies. The kitchen fire wasn't responding to water. It was much hotter than a small fire like that would be and it wasn't as noisy as such a hot fire would be. Given the systems one and two seem to perform complementary functions, when and where can they go wrong together? It turns out that both systems are oriented towards confirming what we already believe to be true. System one does this from the start. Psychologist Daniel Gilbert demonstrated that to make sense of a proposition such as whitefish eat candy, we have to first ascertain what it would mean if the proposition were true. Only then can we decide whether or not to disbelieve it. System 2 follows up by implementing a method of searching for confirming evidence, which is called a positive test strategy. If asked to find out whether someone is extroverted, we'll tend to ask them questions that would confirm this notion, such as, do you like parties? If asked to find out whether someone is introverted, we'll ask questions such as, do you prefer solitary activities? Thus, systems 1 and 2 jointly suffer from confirmation bias, a tendency to seek out and give greater weight to confirming than to disconfirming evidence. Extreme confirmation bias is known colloquially as jumping to conclusions. And this has been linked with people who hold delusions. Delusions are firmly held beliefs that are unswayed by strongly disconfirming evidence. And there's evidence that leaping to conclusions is a key component in generating delusions. 
For instance, when presented with random draws of successive beads of two colors from one of two jars with different ratios of the two colors, for instance, 85 to 15 versus 15 to 85, delusional psychiatric patients have been found to require far fewer draws than healthy people do to conclude which jar the beads came from. Perhaps the most intriguing lesson that the dual systems research has for us about how the mind deals with unknowns is this. System one doesn't deal in doubt or uncertainty. In the face of unknowns, system one bets on an answer and sticks with it. The bet may be guided by relevant experience, but it's an all or nothing choice and evokes belief in it. As Kahneman observes, doubt, uncertainty, indecision, disbelief, and conscious ignorance all are solely the domain of system two. Thank you.